opportunity. First of all, let me thank the organizers for <coughs> inviting me for this. I have been uh, reading about all these uh, you know, the, uh, programs that have been conducted here. Very interesting on very interesting issues, water, etc. And uh, I'm very proud and grateful to be part of this discussion here today. The topic is uh, something which with which I have been involved, not only in the university but out of the university. And I think what is needed today is for all of us to be involved in important issues that concern us that are also not our livelihoods. So, child rights uh, and law protection in Telangana state. When the agitation was there for Telangana state, one of the points that was made and which is made whether it is in Scotland or in Spain or wherever, is that a smaller state can reach the grassroots much better. A smaller state can uh, give access to the most deprived, which a large state cannot. So now that we have the state, we have to show that we can do this. One of the most important, you know, rights of a child or an adult or anyone after security, after food, health, is education. Today, all these are very interrelated also. You cannot have a livelihood without education practically. You cannot have better health, you cannot have uh, you know, so many things. So education is one of the basic rights. And as uh, Venkatrek Bilgaru has said, he has really put in a nutshell the whole issue about education. And we have finally, you know, given the right to education to our people. There are a lot of committees at the national level, state level, at all levels. I'm part of a number of them. The figures that are given, that 100% coverage, etc. So we know, we know that this is not true. So leaving that aside, let us let us see, you know, um, what needs to be done. I think the uh, different parts of the world that have done well, where schooling is compulsory and uh, where every child goes to school, I asked this question to somebody in, in the UK. I said, how do you enforce this? So she looked a little surprised and she said, well, if I see a child on the road during school hours, I will report. Or if I see a neighbor's child during school hours at home consistently, I will report. So that means if you see during school hours a child is not in school, it means the child is not in the right place. So I think we need to reach a stage where we, it should bother us that during school hours, why is the child working here or in a home or in a, uh, you know, in the bazaar or loitering on the streets or anything? Unless we do that, I, I don't think we are going to achieve things because passing a law doesn't really. Uh, it, it helps, but it really doesn't uh, get you reach your goal uh, very quickly. And especially since we know the state has been literally dragged into passing this 
because the whole world is watching. This is part of the Millennium Development Board. And we are really not reaching there. We still have the officially the largest number of illiterates. And there is no excuse. There is no excuse after 60 years. Because today if we decide every child has to be in school, then like the point that was made in the, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Uh, Venkatredi by him, that in 10 years, every child will be officially out of school. That is having achieved something. So it's not going to take 60 years. It can only, it needs to take only 10 years. And then, where are the gaps? Unfortunate, unfortunately, the gaps are, uh, again, like has been mentioned, social acceptance, but social acceptance not by the deprived. They are accepting it. I know maid servants in homes where they are earning 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 who want to send their children to private school and give tuition because they, the child can't keep pace, pace and also because the government school is not good enough. So they have those aspirations and we are failing them and we, we have to carry our, uh, our governments, our bureaucracies, we have to push them into it. And something like the group that is here today, a citizens group, we need to have these citizens groups and a very strong movement. So this acceptance has to be by the elite. The elite who think it is good for our children to go to the best schools, but really we don't think that the poor need to go. We really don't think that, so long as our work gets done, we are very happy about it. So I, I don't want to take all my 15 minutes, we can give the rest for a discussion. And uh, I, I want to just give one example, because uh, as a minority, I'm expected to say something about minorities, especially Muslims. And I'm in a happy state where I'm a trustee and a member of a an aided school, a government aided school, which is 75 years old. This was started by my great aunt for poor girls. It has about a thousand girls today. And uh, my uncle who was in the Indian Army retired, he's 90 plus now, has been going every day to that school for 40 odd years. And the school has the best results. The poorest of the poor. Because even Muslim families will send the son to a private school and a, and a daughter to a government school. So a government or a government aided school, we get the, the poorest of the poor. There is so much acceptance, no mother or father says, why is my child, uh, you know, why should the child go up to the 10th class? There is hardly any dropout. There is no pata or anything, because my great aunt who founded it, was against, you know, putting children, putting girls, uh, you know, at home in the guise of Bhakta. So they come to school, they come in their uniform, there's regular attendance. And yesterday there was a function in which my uncle went after a long time in a wheelchair because that's his life. Uh, three girls who had been awarded for Top media. This is a multimedia school uh, for getting the highest marks in the state in multimedia schools. 95 percent and 93 percent and 93 percent. And everywhere these girls go, they have so much confidence. When the Hyderabad Metro organized an essay writing competition, I think it was last year or so. Uh, for in all the regional mediums, the uh, theme being of Metro Safe Metro, Hyderabad Metro Safe Metro or something. And this was uh, organized uh, in some public uh, hall. 
the out of the five top Urdu, uh, and there was no age bar there. Uh, the top, uh, five uh, top Urdu, uh, you know, uh, these things was uh, three were awarded to this school, to girls from this school. So I think we cannot take shelter and say that girls will drop out from school, or Muslim girls will drop out from school, or tribal girls will drop out from school, or any such thing. But the resistance I find, unfortunately, is from the state that has built its own rules in such a way, it is, it is entangled in its own rules, and it cannot support education. And I'm again citing an instance from the school. Being a government-aided school, it was, it had a certain percentage of government teachers. Now there are only two. They've all retired. And uh, when I raised these issues uh, in meetings with where there was, um, you know, various senior, very senior, I don't want to say what level, but very senior bureaucrats, there is no response why, you know, these schools are excluded and deprived of teachers. Of course, the private sector can pay, but you can't pay the salaries and get the best. Still, in spite of that, we are doing this. And I most, you know, I regret to say that in one meeting, Secretary Education said, Oh, I know about private schools, somebody starts them and we are expected to send teachers. Why should we? So I said, you know, you are talking in terms of providing building, uh, providing latrines, providing security with the, you know, wall. All those things are here. The running water, the electricity, all you have to do is to provide the teachers. But <clears throat> there is some law in which aided schools are not being provided teachers. And I think every, every school, every government school should have citizens who are concerned, like all of us here, should be involved with the running of every government school. So that we can do hand-holding, we can, you know, get things done for them and push them forward, try to raise resources. And once this thing gets going, I think there is no stopping. Because today, we just have to, the Urdu media carried a report of a girl who had talked in Urdu. This is like, almost like six or eight years ago. Uh, and uh, she was looking for resources to continue her education. Today, they don't need to do that. But at that time, a poor driver in Dubai or something read this and said, well, this is my 6,000 rupees or 5,000 rupees for this child to continue her education. So any success inspires others. So now there are uh, four, one English teacher that's being supported by some group, group of young women who have sponsored this so that these girls do good, uh, you know, English. And again, in, although it is Urdu medium, it has to be because they are first generation learners and they will all drop out if it was English medium or Telugu medium or anything. These girls are able to go into interlevel in English medium, not just Urdu medium. And two years ago, four girls managed to get into medicine without any uh, donations. So, I'm just saying this to show that it can be done. If in the most difficult circumstances, you know, with the poorest girls, where the parents are supposed to give the biggest resistance, you need to have a happy environment, you need to have committed teachers, you need to make it you know, a fun-filled uh, experience and you need to have various other, you know, inputs that the best schools have and the poorest will stand on their feet in no time. 
I think I've taken perhaps more than 15 minutes. I'll stop here. Uh, I just want 